Welcome back to the Pacific Century, a Hoover Institution podcast on China, America, and the fate of the 21st century. I'm your host, Misha Oslin, and I am thrilled today to be joined by Ling Ling Wei from the Wall Street Journal. Those of you who uh, read the journal, and I know most of you do, uh, absolutely know Ling Ling's work. She is the chief China correspondent for the journal. She is also the co-author of the excellent book, Superpower Showdown, which I highly encourage all of you to get. And she is the chief writer of the new WSJ China newsletter, which you can subscribe to by going to WSJ.com. So Ling Ling, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Michelle. Well, I, you know, I've been uh, hoping for an opportunity to uh, to have you on and and you know meet with you, talk with you personally because I'm such a huge fan of of the work you've done. And it seemed that APEC, which is happening right now uh, here in San Francisco, and uh, your uh, and the meeting between President Biden and President Xi is just a perfect opportunity to get your insights, which have been you know some of the most clear and important on on everything that's going on. So. Why don't we just jump right into it? Let me ask you, uh, even as this is all happening around us right now, your overall assessment of how the summit between the two went, and then we can get into more specifics about what each side wanted, what you think they're getting, and what this means going forward. Sure. Um, uh, first of all, thank you so much for the very kind, generous introduction. Uh, yes, um, you know, this uh, summit between President Biden and China's leader Xi Jinping this week, um, you know, was uh, quite an event. The very fact that the two met, you know, was such an accomplishment. You know, they started talking again um, for after many months, you know, uh, it, you know, that just shows how bad the relationship had, you know, become uh, over uh, the, the course of the past year. So, um, you know, the they met, uh, they talked for uh, quite a few hours, four hours also, and they had lunch together. They took a walk uh, in the woods. Um, so, you know, the, uh, opt optics or looked fine. And in terms of sub substance, um, you know, it's very important. Both of them met. Uh, I do, uh, believe that the meeting, uh, helped stabilize the relationship a little bit because, you know, really the window of opportunity, uh, was quickly narrowing given the upcoming presidential election in the United States next year. Um, you know, China undoubtedly would again become very hot button issue. So, um, you know, from the readouts, uh, on, you know, from both sides, you know, they did reach, uh, a number of agreements, right? You know, you may call it low hanging fruit, but it's still important. Um, you know, first of all, both sides, uh, you know, agreed to restart uh, contacts between their militaries, uh, which is so important in terms of preventing conflicts, right? And also of, is a big issue for the United States is uh, China's um, agreement to uh, crack down on um, fentanyl. Um, so um, that 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 was a big deal because you know the the drug um, you know has been killing millions of Americans, especially young people, every year. Uh, so you know it's very important for the Biden administration to get that. You know, for the Chinese side, um, you know, uh, they really have been pushing for some kind of dialogue on artificial intelligence, um, you know, as a way to talk to the Americans about the issue and potentially, you know, prevent further uh, restrictions on you know AI transfer to China. So, um, you know, both sides have agreed to start some sort of uh, uh, dialogue on AI. So that's important, but we, but, it, but, but, you know, but we don't know exactly how this mechanism works, right? Uh, there are not very uh, many details have been uh, disclosed. Um, you know, I was told there could be some kind of uh, track 1.5 
uh, dialogue on AI, you know, that, that means not exactly official dialogue, but, you know, semi-official, uh, you know, with both sides um, putting forward experts uh, in, in that area. Uh, so, uh, and again, you know, for, uh, for the Chinese, nothing matters more than Taiwan, you know, going into the meeting. For the Chinese side, going into the meeting, they had wanted the U.S. side, uh, President Biden, to be more firmly oppose Taiwan independence, you know, in in the um, uh, you know uh, agreement um, that was uh, published uh, after the meeting, uh, but you know, uh, but the U.S. side rejected that request. So instead, uh, President Biden basically stuck to the um, usual talking point, the, the, the traditional position, which is, you know, uh, the U.S. Um, adheres to this one China policy. Um, so, um, you know, uh, but even the Chinese street out, you can tell the issue about Taiwan remains the most sensitive issue for Beijing. Uh, the Xinhua readout of the meeting talked about, um, you know, how Xi Jinping really elaborated China's position on Taiwan and urged the U.S. side not to support Taiwan's independence, uh, not to arm Taiwan, and, you know, would support uh, eventual reunification uh, of Taiwan. So that's a really very important for, for the Chinese. So you you mentioned so that was a great that's a great laydown of of what happened in your assessment since you've been looking at this so carefully and and you start off by saying optics versus substance um, was it more about the optics do you think I mean I I was also told by by people in the State Department and you know everyone messages the way that they want but that it was really the Chinese who had pushed really hard for this meeting, uh, obviously, as, as you've reported and, and your colleagues, you know, the Chinese economy uh, compared to even just a year ago, but certainly two years ago is in much worse shape. Um, there's been a lot more pressure. Obviously, she had, uh, uh, you know, the political successes of the party Congress, um, but he's facing a whole host of headwinds. And so they really wanted the meeting to show that sort of things haven't changed, right? Everything is, is it's still really about the US and China. So in your view, was it you know what what was more significant was it the optics of this or was it the substance and then maybe we can get delve down a little bit more into some of the the, the substance that you talked about Sure, that's a great question. Uh, both sides really wanted this meeting. The Biden administration, you know, also had a huge incentive to have a successful summit with Xi uh, so that uh, the U.S. can show to allies in Europe and Asia, you know, we're managing the responsibility respons uh, responsibly, this relationship responsibly. Um, for, the, for the Chinese side, you're absolutely right, Michelle, you know, even authoritarian leaders uh, have uh, domestic politics to worry about. Uh, for Xi Jinping, despite the fact that his position uh, is, is very uh, secure, you know, there's no challenge to his hold on power, but he still needs to, uh, you know, uh, tackle the economic pressure, which is building up significantly, um, you know, within China. You talk to entrepreneurs, you talk to investors, you know, they all hope for um, a better relationship with the United States. Then, you know, that could, you know, that means, um, you know, the U.S. market is still open for them. They can still uh, they can keep selling stuff to Americans. They can keep get, uh, you know, capital, American capital to flow into China, which, you know, which is really important for the economy at a time. It is burdened by, you know, a property crisis and too much debt. So foreign money, foreign capital, foreign know-how is in demand uh, more than ever. So, you know, that that's the, really an issue here for, for uh, Xi Jinping. He needs also to show to the Chinese uh, public that he's got this relationship under control, at least, you know, for now, you know, the meeting, the biggest um uh, accomplishment from this meeting is, uh, you know, uh, there's a truth of 
of sort, right? Um, it, we 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 probably can uh, expect uh, some stability in the relationship in you know in the coming weeks and months, but uh, but you know it's a very fragile one, right? Um, it could be rock, the boat could be rocked yet again uh, by right. anything. So we'll see. So actually, so that's a great it's a great question. Then um, you mentioned there will be likely some short term stability. Before we get into specifics, then I would just want to ask you in your assessment, did anything fundamental change in the relationship? Yes. So uh, to your question, um, right? They had this meeting, but that not to be confused with any you know, fundamental change in the underlying relationship. It remains a very competitive relationship. You know, one interesting point about this summit is the fact that, you know, Xi Jinping seemed to really disagree with the Americans' description about the nature of the relationship, right? Um, America, uh, the U.S. side, I'm very clear about the competition, is a competitive relationship. The question is how to manage our competition, right? But you see from Xi Jinping's remarks, um, you know, especially to the business community the other day, it really struck me. He's basically saying, okay, then how to define our relationship is very important. Are we friends or are we, are we enemies, right? The underlying message is that if we're friends, then everything can be resolved. We can just talk talk through our issues, your problems, how we can help you. But if we're enemies, what's the point, right? So it's a very clear message to the business community. Okay, for now, I know you have complaints about doing business in China. I know you have all those issues, but you know, but let's 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 see what you can do for us first. If you can play a constructive role in help in helping ease tensions between the two governments, then if you can help do that, we can move to the next step, which is talk about your issues and make you know uh, make it easier for you to invest in the Chinese market. So, so I think the fact that Xi Jinping to this day still rejects the idea. Uh, the definition of a competitive relationship between these two countries is very interesting. Well, I think you just raised, I wanted to get to the specifics, which I still want to, but you know, you raised this dinner with the CEOs and you just gave an incredibly, um, you know, an incredibly insightful analysis of a very sophisticated approach, but one that I think critics might say it's old wine and new bottles, meaning this is really the playbook that the Chinese always use, which is to say, you can't be very careful of upsetting the broad, big, top scale meta relationship between the US and China, i.e., as you phrased it, friend or foe. And then once we've stabilized that, then later on at some indeterminate point in some indeterminate way, we'll get to your actual complaints, right? Which was, as you as you reported so well uh, just yesterday, that there was very little for the business community that came out of that dinner. There were no promises for greater access or protection of IP or the like. So it's actually an incredibly sophisticated, yet some would say well-tried approach, which is to say, just keep things going and then eventually we'll get to the actual problems. But the question is, do you ever get to the problem? So with that, let me just ask you then about some of the specifics. Um, let's talk about the fentanyl first, because, of course, the Trump administration had an agreement to try to crack down on uh, different elements of the fentanyl trade. That was back in 2019. And that that really went nowhere. Is there any reason to expect that things will be different this time? Well, as President Biden put it. Trust but verify, right? Going back, um, harking back to President Reagan, of course. Exactly, of course, right? exactly. So you know, the years China has agreed to 
quite a variety of things, Stray, but the track record, um, you know, may tell a different story. Uh, but, you know, we do uh, see some very immediate action following the agreement that came out of the summit, you know, uh, China's uh, uh, security apparatus uh, just recently released uh, some some rules, you know, about choking off uh, this uh, uh, chemical, uh, fentanyl um, chemical, uh, the flow of that into the United States. So, you know, they, they, you know, it's a positive sign, but obviously, you know, we, we need to see, you know, more follow through, you know, better enforcement of the rules and, and all that. Can I actually ask you about the rule and, and what they agreed, if I'm correct, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that they're going to try to crack down on ingredients that go into fentanyl. We're not talking about Chinese, you know, Coast Guard and maritime ships or the or the aerial post office intercepting shipments which go to Mexico and, and sometimes actually are shipped directly here in small packages or go to Canada. So they're they're doing a, a different approach, one that is almost it's 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 less visible. Is that would that be a fair assessment? Yes, I agree. Okay, so so we'd have to see about that. Let me let me ask you then about the mill mill, the military to military relations. What so what in your sense is the um, is the likelihood that restarting them will actually lead to any better? Um, understanding of of each other's security sides. I mean, I guess I guess the question is implicit on what did the mill mill talks do beforehand? Because obviously we've had, as you put it, you know, sort of a a relentlessly negative trend in relations, including on security issues, whether it's South China Sea, it's Taiwan, it's Hong Kong, it's Xinjiang, it's it's um, uh, the question of weaponization of AI and the like. What did the mill mill relations achieve beforehand, meaning, you know, the, the, the communications, what should we expect from this new one, especially with a Xi Jinping who has, um, you know, purged some of the military leaders just in the past months to get um, whether it's it's greater control or just those he trusts more into position? Right. Um, you know, uh, it's so important these days to have this mill mill conversation because you know we have seen increasingly aggressive behavior by the Chinese military, you know, the intercepts, um, and those are extremely dangerous, right? Could really lead to losses uh, of, of lives and, um, you know, uh, bigger conflicts. And also um, the use of increasingly sophisticated technology for military purposes like AI, you know, that's also something that needs to be talked about, you know, what kind of standards you each side is adhering to. So all those issues are super important um, in terms of past dialogue um, on military. You know, uh, I wish I knew more about, you know, what they talked about and what possibly those discussions have led to. Um, but, you know, it, the details are very um, uh, little. So I, I don't really want to... Um, I don't really know too much about uh, the past dialogue, uh, but just you know, for for the moment, um, restarting this military dialogue is just um, so crucial. But again, you know, as we have seen many times, mill to mill dialogue also, you know, traditionally has been the first one to be suspended, right? If China you know, feels um, unhappy about things the U.S. has done, as we witnessed last year, um, their anger over uh, the U.S. support for Taiwan that really led to the suspension of the military talks. So we'll we'll right. see if, uh, you know, uh, we'll see how, you know, um, effective the talks are going to be and we're also going to see if again this is something that could be suspended uh, you know at, at first sign of the chinese unhappiness with the americans and and they did uh, agree or or uh, i guess they agreed earlier but they reiterated um to set up a hotline between Biden and she, and that of course is one of the has has traditionally been one of the great um 
examples of how this competition or adversarial relationship between China and the U.S. is different from the one in the Cold War between the U.S. and the Soviets, where there were multiple channels of communication, as well as multiple agreements on on what we what the White House likes to call rules of the road, right? I mean, standards of behavior, whether it was incidents at sea between U.S. and Soviet ships, or of course the celebrated hotline that was set up uh, in the '60s after the uh, after the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, have you heard anything about um, how effective? People feel, especially on our side, uh, that uh, uh, how effective the hotline will be. Have they have they tried it yet? I mean, what what is the assurance? Right, the way it's phrased is, when I pick up the phone, he'll pick up the phone. What is the assurance that you're hearing that our side really has confidence that that is going to happen? Um, I think um, it's also in China's interest to pick up the phone. Uh, should something really you know, uh, urgent um, happen. One would so, hope. Uh, one would hope. They one would, would hope. One interest, would hope. Right? right. Exactly. I mean, I. You know, as we discussed earlier, they're facing so many challenges. You know, economic problems in particular, and also, um, you know, China's military. It's not ready. They haven't fought a war for so many years. Um, you know, they not ready for any kind of combat conflict, right? So it's it's still you know, despite the fact that you know, Xi Jinping might have seemed to be more uh, of a risk taker than his predecessors. He still have an interest in, you know, maintaining stability here. Uh, he doesn't want war at the moment, at least. Uh, he, you know, um, he still wants to focus on, you know, buying time to build up continue building up the resilience of the Chinese system. So it's, it's really in their interest to pick up the, the call. It's a great point about the military, the China, which is something that people have not focused on as much because they look at the surface of a very impressive military and, and don't talk about the point you raised, which is it's a very untested an untried military. So that, that is something I think important um, to keep in mind. Let me um let me ask one or two more specific questions and get back to the to the sort of bigger atmospherics. Um uh, very quickly, did they I, I didn't see in the readout, I may have missed it. Um there has been talk lately uh that there will be some type of arms not arms control talks, but talks over nuclear weapons, given revelations about the growth of the Chinese uh, nuclear development uh, plan and 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 the like. Uh, did any of that come up from your understanding? Um, that is not a major, um, you know, uh, area where there has been tremendous progress um, yeah. the, the you know the chinese has been reluctant to talk about uh nuclear arsenal for obvious reasons um so you know we we don't have too much visibility into that issue but just on the um a topic about china's military uh, Chinese military's readiness. Um, you know, obviously, even Xi Jinping doesn't believe that they're ready, right? Um, the most recent uh, crackdown on high-level military officials should show, you know, he's kind of pissed off, right, by continued corruption within the ranks. Um, and, you know, they spent so much money every year buying equipment, R and D, you know, um, equipping the whole military, and where did the money go? So um, you know um, that the you know that's a the crackdown. It really is the reflection of his um, very strong desire to ensure that the military is capable of fighting and capable of winning the fight, and they're not there yet. Um, you know, also, but I think, you know, the morale 
uh, within the military officers these days is also kind of low because so many of their colleagues, their former bosses have been rounded up. So, you know, it, it, it's going to be a long way to go. Uh, but, you know, they're definitely trying to, you know, get ready. I think that's a great point. I think it's an important perspective to keep in mind in our debates, of course, over possible timelines uh, regarding Taiwan, vis-a-vis Taiwan, what China might do. I would extend that to the to the South China Sea. Now, of course, comparatively, the Chinese, no matter how untested or how little morale there is or how unready they are, far outstrip and dwarf almost all of the other militaries that they would encounter, except perhaps Japan's. Um, but, you know, they are not certainly feel ready for the big contest, the showdown, right, you know, with the U.S., but with smaller militaries, that's, that's a very different calculation. And so, uh, but I think your point's an important one is we try to come up with a, you know, with an overall picture. So let me let me just shift for the last specific question and then go back, as I mentioned, to the atmospherics. Um, AI dialogue. What does that really mean? Um, you know, no one, you know, we throw it around AI, AI, no one, I think really understands, you know, there's generative AI, there's, you know, uh, large language models, there's machine, there's all these different types of things that none of us are specialists in, right? Uh, the policy people. Um, so what are they actually talking about? And why is it a good thing? And what might be the dangers of engaging in discussions about AI with the Chinese? Right. Uh, such good questions. You know, I'm certainly not counting myself as an AI specialist. Um, so it's very unclear what kind of specific issues both sides will talk about, you know, if this dialogue does happen. Um, I would expect some kind of standards, um, you know, how do you uh, govern the use of AI in different areas, in, you know, the implication uh, of using AI for military purposes. So the, those are very important because, you, you know, again, this, uh, the, it, it, it relates to security, right? Um, if you, you really do not want accident to happen because um, misuse of such sophisticated technology. So I guess, you know, that very, um, that's my very, like, lacking, limited uh, understanding of this issue. But the risk uh, is, especially, you know, based on my conversations with a lot of people on the US side, the risks from their views that, okay, talk is good, but they but some of them do not want this to become another, you know, kind of uh, dialogue that could just, uh, you know, tie the U.S. side up, you know, because for years, uh, China and the U.S. have had so many dialogue, right? Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes it's, it, you know, for many people, it's, it's kind of frustrating because it never lead to meaningful outcomes. So the risk here is, you know, uh, from some of the people I've talked to on the U.S. side, they don't want this to become a way for China to just keep engage, uh, you know, uh, to keep using this kind of dialogue as a way to prevent, um, you know, the U.S. Uh, further, uh, you know, tighten restrictions on technology sales to China for national security purposes. Because, you know, China does have an interest in slow, slowing down the pace of sanctions against Chinese companies. So I, I wanted to, uh, you know, follow up with that on, on asking about some of these uh, potential semiconductor export controls, uh, what we've seen um with uh for example nvidia which which was barred from sending off exporting the high end chips but then uh created developed chips that were just underneath the bar and then those have come under um you know come under scrutiny so i the, not from the technical side of course but but from the political side did you get any uh sense was there any discussion about either uh maintaining or tightening those restrictions or potentially even loosening them 
Right. Um, you know, that kind of discussion debate uh, has been ongoing for a long time. And most recently, uh, before the summit between Biden and Xi Jinping, you know, the administration did issue uh, some new rules, right, uh, that further tightened the sale of uh, high end trips to China. Um, so I, I don't I do not think the uh, the trend will be reversed um, anytime soon. I think, uh, you know, more measures are being discussed, being debated, you know, uh, because there is a balance that the administration has to strike, right, between protecting national security and, you know, still allowing U.S. businesses to do business and to make mm -hmm. money, right, mm -hmm. including with China. Uh, so it's still a huge debate go ongoing. Um, and also, uh, as you know, Michelle, um, both sides, the Chinese government and the U.S. government has agreed to set up those working groups, right, to talk about economic, commercial, financial issues and the export controls definitely, you know, will come up uh, as a key point of concern, especially for the Chinese side. They will do uh, their best to try to reverse the trend or at least slow down the pace of sanctions. But again, the question for the U.S. side is, you know, OK, what can you do right to uh, get the, some of the measures rolled back or prevent us from doing more? Um, you know, that kind of a dialogue, uh, we'll see if it's just a, a, a talk shop shop uh, or, you know, something that could lead to meaningful outcomes. So there's, there's other probably specifics we could get into, but I, I'd like to switch back to the, the sort of bigger question of the atmospherics. Um, well, one of them, uh, which was straddles both, uh, was, of course, that uh, Xi Jinping went to a dinner of American CEOs uh, in San Francisco, he didn't have dinner with President Biden. He went to a, a CEO dinner, where which had, um, uh, and again, as as you all reported, fewer tech CEOs, but many financial and and uh, I guess what we call manufacturing CEOs. And he received what one might describe as a a lavish, warm welcome. Uh, you you reported a uh, a standing ovation as he walked in the room. Um, and yet you did you, you you referred to this a little bit earlier. Uh, there weren't a lot of specifics that he offered, but I just what's your take on that? Um, you know, it's received um, it, it's been somewhat criticized uh, in certain quarters, of course, that the U.S. CEOs were uh, giving a standing ovation to Xi Jinping. It's also been criticized that they did so without getting anything in return. Uh, again, something you, um, you very insightfully mentioned. But can you just talk a little bit more about? that dinner and 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 what it might have meant and whether what we see is a you know is a further evidence of a split let's say between the security community which is worried about all the things you've been talking about uh and the private economic community which is is really pushing for deep re-engagement is that is that fair so maybe talk a little bit about the dinner if you could sure um you know uh the the, the dinner was really uh quite a event you know i was uh fortunate to be one of the reporters um you know allowed to cover the event you know uh very tight security obviously and um you know uh we were all asked to be in the back of the room uh not allowed to you know actually mingle with the guests uh, very Did much you get to eat did you get to eat? Uh, well, I, I had no time to eat. Okay. I just, just I was, to... yeah, very, um, you know, focused on really reporting out uh, the, the whole event. So, um, you know, bearing in mind, this dinner, the guests to this dinner, yes, they're primarily from the business community, but but they do not represent the entire U.S. private sector. So they they were invited because some you know a lot of them were considered by the Chinese side as as friends, right? As as friendly to China. Great so, point. 
Right. So the standing ovation probably is the ref- was the reflection of that. And they're, you know, they're friends anyway. They wanted to show respect to this leader from the world's second largest economy. Um, so, um, it, you know, there were about 350 guests in the entire room. Uh, and uh, the, there is a head table up in the front. And the head table, it's a very big table, 44 guests uh, sat with Xi Jinping. And a lot of them were uh, CEOs from, you know, the Wall Street firms like BlackRock, Blackstone, you know, Bridgewater Associates. Um, uh, so, and, and you know, they're big technology firms as well. Apple was there, Qualcomm was there. Um, so, you know, but, you know, to me uh, was, if you do a compare and contrast, right? The last time, Xi Jinping had a similar reception, similar dinner was back in 2015 when he went to Seattle and toured Microsoft headquarters, right? Back then, you know, the reception actually was much warmer uh, than this time around. Um, you know, all, all those uh, big American CEOs, uh, especially from technology companies, really flocked to pay homage to him. You know, uh, you have uh, Facebook as well back then. Uh, And on the Chinese delegation, there were quite a few tech entrepreneurs from China, you know, Jack Ma, right? Uh, Alibaba. Uh, But this time around, there are very few uh, Chinese entrepreneurs that were part of the um, uh, official Chinese delegation. I actually didn't see any. So that just shows how things have changed in China. The crackdown, the government crackdown on the private sector. Really, um, you know, if you want more evidence about that, this is like a one more piece of supporting evidence. Um, so. Okay, so those were the guests, right? And obviously, they're not just business types. They're, you know, also the the, the um, uh, Xi Jinping's old friends from Iowa, right? The first state he visited when he was still very low level official uh, back in the eighties, and also the Flying Tiger uh, veterans were also invited to this event. You know, all, and those are all part of the whole plan to show that, you know, we still care about the relationship with the United States. Look, our history. He really started his speech uh, by, you know, giving us a walk down memory lane, you know, really uh, started all the way back to the World War II, you know, talk about how U.S. and China worked together to you know, fight against the Japanese, you know, uh, his first trip to the United States, how warmly he was received by his American hosts and the uh, start of the uh, ping pong diplomacy that led to the for- uh, establishment of the former ties of the both nations. So, so you know, he, he did try to uh, give the speech a human touch, right? Let's let's let let's remember those good times, right? We have come a long way. However, um, you know, based on my conversations with many people in the audience after the dinner, they were disappointed that there was no mention, no talk about trade and investment for a room full of CEOs. Right. They wanted to hear um, from the very top leader. OK, what's your assessment of the China's economy? What policies are you, you know, adopting to continue to make foreign business feel comfortable about invest- investing in your country? Right. Especially given the fact that this year has been a year where a lot of uh, American businesses, um, you know, felt increased pressure from the Chinese government. You know, we have seen raise detention investigations involving U.S. companies. So, you know, that's what they're 
going into the meeting, that's where a lot of industry representatives were hoping that they could get some kind of inkling from the very top. You know, they were saying, oh, you know, he probably would make you know, uh, re repeat the longstanding position on, you know, China uh, will continue to reform and open, you know, the economy, the society. But he didn't even mention reform and opening. It's pretty interesting. Um, he mentioned high quality development. That's just code for, OK, um, you know, slower growth, but our focus will be more on high end manufacturing technology in th those sectors. So um, so for some of the executives in the audience, they felt like that was the disappointment and a lost opportunity for Beijing, actually, to offer some kind of assurance for the business community. And and just from your observation of him, uh, was this a confident leader? Was this a leader who was uh, seemed, um, I don't want to say under pressure, but did, did he seem uh, dismissive that he didn't really care? Did he, did, you know, what, what, what did you take away from him, since this is one of the few chances that non-government interactors were able to be in a room with him, hear him speak, observe his body language, what was he like? He came across as being very confident. Um, and, you know, there's, he didn't sound any apologetic at all, you know, especially when he talked about China's Belt and Road program, you know how much that has been criticized, right, by both private sector um, investors and you know other government, uh, other governments, you know, especially in the West, for how that program really settled a lot of developing countries with too much debt. But you know, he actually made a mention of Belt and Road as a way to tell the audience, you know, those are all opportunities. You guys can work with us, you know, in, in, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, promoting our own initiative. He didn't sound apologetic at all. And, um, you know, that that's really interesting to me. And again, um, and also the, the fact that uh, he you know, talked about the nature of the relationship. You know, he told the business community, it is very important for us to first define, you know, our relationship. Are we friends or are we foes? And what can you do to make sure that um, the U.S.-China relationship remains stable? And then we can talk about other issues. So the, the, the whole speech, um, you know, really um, is, um, you know, felt with a lot of, uh, you know, platitudes, you know, about friendship with, between the U.S. and China, and also kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, he basically, you know, the underlying message from that speech to the business community is very clear. Um, you know, uh, it's that's see what can you do to help us uh, before we get to your concerns. Right. And we should probably note that the seats at the main table, as you reported, went for $40,000 a seat. Less, I guess, in the um, in the, the bleacher seats, as we in Chicago would, would call them. Um, so to, to sort of wrap up then, um, and this has been just a fantastic overview of, of what what's happened and some of the different elements of it. What do we expect going forward? What should we be looking for going forward? Obviously, you know, you will be reporting on it as it happens. So even in your own mind, what is it that you're going to be focusing on going forward that uh, policymakers, scholars, investors, uh, you know, strategists, planners should be thinking about you know, over the, you know, whether it's the next six months, nine months, a year, or the like coming out of these meetings? Well, we'll see whether or not um, those uh, discussions, dialogue will actually happen, right? Mill to mill, you know, economic, financial, 
and other issues, right? So uh, that's the, f- the first test. Um, and how substantive those discussions will be. Um, and at this point, if the two sides keep talking, it's really a good thing and a wing for, for, for all of us. Um, and, you know, then going forward, we'll, we'll see whether or not those discussions will lead to any meaningful outcomes you know first of all they have to start talking i mean they agreed to restart the talks and then we'll see whether or not they actually you know uh walk the walk right actually right. start the talks so um you know next year is going to be brutal right for the relationship uh, and uh, very soon we will see uh the outcome from the taiwan election right. january then, 24th so that's coming exactly up exactly so. right and then you know the u.s presidential election the campaign all of 2024 season. all of 2024 can't escape it exactly, exactly. okay so we've got that. right so what this week did was basically put a floor under the relationship but how sturdy that floor is will be tested very very soon so your your point uh on the talks i guess it, it's the old question of quality versus quantity you know that's one first of all they get quantity of talks and perhaps more important or, or equally important is what's the quality uh, of those talks um clearly recognized and understood headwinds, the election in Taiwan, the election in the US. Um, anything big in China that that might affect the relationship? I mean, the party Congress is over. Um, you know, the, the minor m- meetings don't really seem to is there anything that that could uh, from the Chinese side potentially um, affect what what happens over the next year that you're aware of? Well, for China, I mean, uh, the biggest issue these days is really is the Chinese economy. The economy, yeah. um, right? Are they going to prevent a full-blown financial crisis from happening? Because right now, um, you know, as we and others have reported, um, the uh, the whole economy really is struggling. All those young people having trouble finding jobs, and the property crisis is really deepening. Uh, local governments. Uh, uh, are also running out money and struggling to repay debt. So they really have a full plate of issues to worry about. Um, you know, so how they manage the risks, how they manage the debt problems, how they manage the property crisis um, are, are all things we need to be, um, you know, on the lookout for because how interconnected the global economy has become, right? Whatever China is experiencing definitely will have impact on the rest of the uh, global markets and global growth. And another uh, near term, uh, for the near term, um, uh, one uh, thing that a lot of investors and you know uh, policy uh, thinkers and makers are on the lookout for is when China is going to hold the third plenum. Uh, it's, you know, traditionally third plenums have been very econ focused, right? right? So people are really hoping that China will still have this third plenum. You know, we still do, do not know the date and the government hasn't um, announced the date, you, you know, if history is any guide, the third plenum usually takes place in November, but mm-hmm. now we're, you know, um, November 17th, right? So it's only a couple of weeks left. So we do not know whether or not the third plenum will really take place, you know, before the year end or next year, but that's something people are looking forward to um, because, you know, Xi Jinping has talked about, uh, we need to coordinate development with security, but you know, but that's such a contradictory policy, right? Uh, because he obviously has put security, the need to fend off any perceived foreign threats ahead of development. 
So that has caused many foreign investors, foreign business, uneasy about investing in China. So people are looking for some clarity from events like the Sir uh, Planum uh, to give them guidance about you know whether or not we should keep pulling in money into China. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, and and other things that. Are ongoing, of course, the um, uh, the confrontation between China and the Philippines in the South China Sea, or at least the standoff that's there. Um, unresolved issues, of course, uh, related to India-China relations and and the whole relationship with Japan, including the new U.S. Japan Korea trilateral set of agreements. So there there is a lot that um, can affect, if not cloud, this relationship. So we could go on and on, but I, I think um, we've, we've come to, to a good stopping point and uh, really appreciate you taking time to uh, explain all this to us. I hope you'll be able to come on again. Uh, we've been speaking with Ling Ling Wei, who is the chief China correspondent for the Wall Street Journal, uh, the author of Superpower Showdown, uh, and the new WSJ China Must Read newsletter. So Ling Ling, thank you so much for joining the Pacific Century. It was a pleasure. Thank you. So for the Pacific Century, I'm Misha Oslin. Uh, we appreciate you listening in and we will see you next time. This podcast is a production of the Hoover Institution, where we generate and promote ideas advancing freedom. For more information about our work, to hear more of our podcasts or view our video content, please visit hoover.org.